So how fine of a wine can we make from store-bought grape juice? All right, we have done my sweet red wine and it was like really, really simple. We just took some of it out, put some sugar in, added some yeast, shook it up and let it go. So let's find out what happens if we try to use all the best practices we can and flavor this properly to the standards of the wine industry or something. I don't know. I just came up with these standards. There's no, there's no real standards here. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna find out what the gravity reading is of the juice itself. And for that, we're just using standard, I mean, this is just Publix grape juice, okay? The ingredients though, this is important. The ingredients are filtered water, grape juice concentrate, and ascorbic acid. Now, grape juice, it's really hard to find without ascorbic acid. We find in apple juice that it's a less than desirable trait when you're using fruit juices, but in grape juice, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, Cause I think the grape is so much of a stronger flavor. It just doesn't really seem to be a factor. You might be saying, what do I need a reading on the juice for? Well, cause I need to know how much sugar to add. Look at that color. It's so clear already too. I'm expecting it to be in the 1.050 to 1.060 range, because most juices usually are. I just want it to float and get rid of the bubbles so I can see. I got it, I got it, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. It's, good. it's like 1.064. Okay, so that's pretty reasonable. It's a, uh, it's a fairly, let me get a pen. Can you pour that into the? No. Why? Because we're going to weigh this to add our sugar. All right, fine. I want to pour it so I don't knock it over. Well, just be careful. No, I'm going to pour it. I'm going to put it back in here. <gasps> Better safe than have juice everywhere. Hey, it could happen. Let me put these back in the turbos. Yeah, because we're getting juice everywhere. See? All right, if you are concerned about juice, could you recap this? I will recap this because you asked me so nicely. Thank you. All right, so. All right, so the way we calculate this is essentially when you're making a wine or any brew, you want to have a target starting gravity, okay? If you don't know what tar target starting gravity you should have, watch a few more videos, do a few other people's recipes, and that'll give you a better idea so that you can start on your own. For this one, I want about 1.100. So if I put 1.100, into the calculator that all my teachers said I would never have handy, it was in my pocket, and I subtract out 1.064, I get 0 0.036. Now, we know that sugar, plain old white sugar, adds 0 0.046 per pound in a gallon of must. Everything's a little bit approximate, but it gives an idea. So I'm gonna divide that by 0 0.046, giving me 0.782. For my math, that's about three quarters of a pound of sugar. If you didn't understand that, I'll put an infographic up explaining all that again, but that's the gist of it. So I got three quarters of a pound of sugar to put in here, no problem. It's right there. Look at that, it's already on the list. It's almost like we did this once before. <laughs> We knew what the juice was from a previous video. We That's did. what it was. Yes. And we calculated it from there. But we want to do it again to show you to so that show way you. you would know how to create a recipe on your own. And that right there, folks, is the most scripted this show has ever been. All right. So now we need our scale and we need our fermenter. And sugar. Sugar. It reminds me of some, the, the, the egg in the Mandalorian, how the, they said that. The egg thing that they made him get? Oh, I don't remember I don't, what they I called it. I don't remember it. what they called it, but anyway, whatever. So I need three quarters of a pound. I went past three quarters of a pound because I wasn't paying attention. I was paying attention, but I'm math illiterate, so. <laughs> yeah, there's 0.87 pounds of sugar in here, so we're gonna put that. What does that really mean ultimately in the end? It means that we're gonna have a little bit more alcohol. That's it, not that much. Let that be a lesson to you. Never daydream while you're pouring your sugar. <laughs> you're trying to figure out what they were calling the egg in the yep, Mandalorian. I was. Yeah. I was. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so next we want to pour in our juices. Now one of these is refrigerated because when we were using this initially to make our sangria. I thought they were quartz and they were gonna Turned out pounds. awesome, by the way. I opened this one and we didn't need it. So it had to go in the refrigerator. But the other one is not open, so it's still factory vacuum sealed. So it was fine. Sanitized for your protection. To remain on the shelf. I didn't shake it we up. I didn't shake it up. 
So you're going to pour some of that yep. in okay. there. You want the goop on the bottom of the bottles. You want the goop on the bottom of the bottles. And it's the a reason... little tannin, it's a little nutrient, you know, it's not a big deal, that. but it is, it's good to have. Yeah. It doesn't hurt, let's put it that way. Whoop. You don't want to spill it, like I am. I actually did far less damage than the wood like you were doing. I know. As is the way. Every drop. Okay, second one in. Did you shake that one? No. <laughs> it's one of those days, folks. All right, this one didn't have any goop on the bottom. <laughs> well, it was cold when you got the cold uh, crashed. The cold crashed. Yep. See? See? It works. Ooh, and the splash is on. By the way, I am intentionally not just pouring it to be silly and fancy. I'm intentionally getting extra air into this brew because you need that in the beginning phases of the colony building up for fermentation. After there's some alcohol being formed, no more air being added, okay? Otherwise you make vinegar. A word about the sugar and the juice mix. You can just use the juice and make a totally fine wine that way. Just remember that ethanol is a flavor, so adding more alcohol to this not only ups the flavor, but it also makes it easier to preserve. Because the higher the ABV, the less likely something can live in it. So this should be somewhere in the 13 to 14 percent ABV range, meaning it's pretty well preserved for the long term. If the alcohol percentage in a potential brew is a little confusing to you, we have some videos on that explaining the differences between the ratio of fermentable sugars and the alcohol tolerance of your particular chosen yeast and how those correlate with each other to create a certain ABV. And you know what I need to do now? You need to stir it. Which means I need my spoon of unusual size. All right. I need to cut this one still. And I just want to mix those sugars in, because if I don't, I won't get an appropriate reading. I can feel them in the bottom. That's an advantage to using a glass container. I can feel the crunching, and I know. People are asking all the time now, um, can they just use a, a plastic bucket? Can, you know, does it have to be done in a glass? No, we just prefer glass. Glass is cleaner. It uh, doesn't harbor bacteria and infectious type things as easily as plastic does. If you scratch plastic, it's much, much harder to get it clean and sanitized. It also, in most cases, create a better seal based on this. Yeah, a lot of the plastic buckets kind of, yeah. they suck at making seals. They do. We actually have lots of plastic buckets and, they in, and we just, they're stored up in the top because we're just probably not going to use them. Plus if you use glass, you can see what you're doing. You can see it working, you can see bubbles, you know, it's just more interesting. Fun for the whole family. Now, you'll notice I'm being rough with the stirring, but not so rough that it splashes everywhere because, you know, you want to make alcohol, not have to mop it up off the floor. So. I'm trying to get more air into this, because this is a harder fermenter to try to pick up and uh, shake around. It just doesn't work real well. There are like the drill attachment things and all that. You could totally do that if you want to. I, I just never think to do it. All right, so it looks like our sugar is dissolved into the liquid. I'm not seeing any crunchies, but we are going to add some things. I'm going to keep our spoon here so we can continue to stir. Right, because this is a fancified this wine. This is fancified, right. So the first thing we're going to add... Before we even get to that, right. let me talk about this for a sure. second. There is nothing wrong with keeping it simple. There is nothing wrong with it at all. No, what ours, we wanted to do though, red wine is actually one of our favorite it's recipes. It's one of our favorite recipes. I wanted to use all the extras and see, like, you know, because some of them are useful for this, okay? It's not like I'm just throwing things in to throw them in. I'm using them because each thing does a specific thing. If you are against using powders in your brews, just skip all this, and this is going to be a perfectly fine wine. You're going to want the yeast. Yeah. That you'll want. Um, and the first ingredient that we're going to add. You'll, you'll want that too. Beyond that, it's all kind of optional. We're doing this because I want to make kind of a sweetish table wine that has a good tannic quality, nice mouth feel. I want it to be a little viscous, and I want it to be like a bright thing that really has a lot of complexity, okay? I know that wasn't the greatest explanation ever, but that's what I have in my head as to what I want. So that way, 
when you watch this video and like half an hour from now in the video, when we're tasting it, you can remember, you'll see if I actually got it right or if I messed it all up. <laughs> wow, that was the most awkward statement I think I've ever made. Anyway. First off is Fermade O. Fermade O is a yeast nutrient. The O stands for organic, but will definitely be bountiful for our yeasts to ferment this brew without being stressed. So, it's got vitamins and minerals in it that the yeast need. There you go. It gets their little yeasty bodies growing strong. And, and what are they going to do because of this? They're going to... Which one do you want me to say? <laughs> you have a few. <laughs> I just have it 2.5 grams and a little bit of water put in there. Uh, they're going to... I don't even remember the, the party <laughs> dance. The happy dance of love. The happy dance of love. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next, because grapes and grape juice, probably by extension, have a lot of pectic, uh, pectins in them, um, that can make for a cloudy brew at the end. We want this to be crystal clear, like gem-like in quality. So I am going to be adding some pectic enzyme. And if you put it in in the beginning of fermentation, use a half teaspoon per US gallon of juice. We used a gallon of juice, so I'm going to do a half teaspoon. Now, if you didn't put any in the beginning, you can use it at the end, but you need to use double because it doesn't work as well after fermentation. Pectic enzyme also has an added benefit if you're using full fruit. If you're using full fruit, it's going to help uh, extract the sugars in the fruit more readily so that they're more accessible to the yeast. Right. The next thing is wine tannin. We're just using a powdered wine tannin. If you really wanted to, you could add a cup of strong black tea to this, any tea of your choice. Uh, the difference is consistency. If you do the tea the same way every time, you'll get the same amount of tannins from it. This, I could just measure and we get the same amount of tannins from it. Now, Brian said any tea of your choice, and I don't want you to be I said black confused tea. with that. Yes, it has to be a black tea, and preferably not a flavored black tea, unless you're using if that you as a flavor adjustment. Like we did an Earl Grey mead. That was we are good. looking simply for the tannin aspect, and that's why we suggest using yeah. just a straight black tea. This is the North Mountain one, and it's actually oak extract. It's like ground up charred oak, basically. So it's kind of like adding wood to your brew for a little while. So this will have a little bit of a more mouthfeel, a little bit of an oaked aspect to it. Half teaspoon. And then grapes can have kind of an odd, uh, they're like tart and sweet at the same time. I want this to have a little bit more of a brightness to it, uh, a little bit more lively, um, a little more spark on the tongue is an easy way to say it. So we're going to be adding acid blend. Now acid blend is just a mixture of the three different types of acids, I think. That's all this is? It doesn't say. Of course they don't say. I know there's tartaric acid and a couple other acids in here. Um, it just gives a nice overall acidity rather than one specific type. And it says right here, oh, do, 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 do. one teaspoon per gallon increases the acidity by 0.1%. I'm going to play it safe and just use a half teaspoon. You know why? Because it's easy to remember. So half teaspoon. We can add more later should we decide we want more. But right now I'm playing it a little on the safe side. You can always balance the flavors when it's finished. Now, if the importance of tannins and acids to your brews is something you'd like to explore more further, we actually did a video just on that topic alone, and I'll link it in the description below. And the last, and the last thing that we need to add is the one thing that's not on the table. <laughs> it's our yeast. Before we add the yeast, I do want to get a reading on this, just so that we know how far off I went because of all that extra sugar. All right, so we got our goop on there from the... It's fine. The wine tannins. Can you get the... Oh, that's just a little bit. Can you get the reading equipment? Yes. Please? And as always, we're going to be using a hydrometer with a graduated cylinder. And the master baster, also known as a turkey baster that just works really, really well. And we're going to grab a sample and put it into our cylinder. I'm expecting that... It's a little higher than I wanted it to be. <laughs> Probably like a 1.120, which might make this come out just a little bit on the sweeter side, which is not a bad thing. If it's too strong, like if it's too high, I can just easily, I can just easily add some water to it. But what do you know? 1.100.
I don't know how that happened because it probably shouldn't be, but it's actually 1.098. Huh? I put in too much sugar, but I didn't put in that much too much sugar. And actually my calculations called for 0.78 pounds of sugar. I have 0.87, so yeah, figure that one out. All right, so 1.096, in case I didn't say that already, two, four, six, yeah, 1.096. That's gonna give us somewhere in the 13% range, which we're going to be using a yeast that is capable of as high as 17.55% in our experience. <laughs> but it is actually rated for, I think, 13 to 15, 14 or 15, something like that. And that yeast is, Wellman 71 Beast, also known as 71B-1122 or something like that. But they, this package doesn't actually say that. So, Derica, why are we using 71B? We are using Lauvin 71B because Lauvin 71B has been isolated and selected by the INRA, something of France, for its ability to produce a high level of esters, allowing it to reinforce the aromatic profile of wines fermented from neutral varieties. Lavin 71B has the capacity to absorb polyphenolic compounds on a cellular wall, which limits tannin structure of young and fresh red wine. Grape must inoculated with Lavin 71B will easily go through malolactic fermentation as 20 to 40% of malic actic can be metabolized by this yeast strain during primary fermentation. Lavin 71B is perfect choice for creating young, fresh, and fruity red, rosé, and white wines that are easy to drink. It is also a good choice for late harvest wines. Thank you for that. Okay, so, whole packet. <laughs> Look at this. It's terrible. It's a terrible packet. If you don't get that joke, watch some of our other videos where we use Red Star. Anyway, so I'm going to use the whole packet. Can you use a partial packet? Of course you can. If you don't want to use... What am I doing now? Back your packet. Yeah, if you don't do that, some get stuck. Um, Julie said that she doesn't like to tear them because yeast gets stuck in the, the, the tear. Yeah. Maybe she's a terrible tearer. Did you get stuck? I didn't get anything stuck in I there. I think that it's stuck in core. But I don't think it's like I a, understand it's you, not really. a, I, I understand. I get it. I just don't think it's a huge issue. I'd much rather be able to go than have to get scissors, and I'll deal with a couple of yeasts not fulfilling their destiny. Okay, what are we going to do now? Uh, we're going to put the lid on in the airlock. I was trying to fool her, see if she knew. <laughs> Tighten that sucker down. And what are we going to do with it now? We're going to let it sit. We're going to put it in the fermentation station, which just happens to be a shelf in a shelving unit that we have cardboard blocking it all off so that the cats can't get to it. It's out of direct sunlight and that sort of thing. It'll maintain a constant temperature of somewhere between 72 and 76 degrees Fahrenheit. I'll put the Celsius in here because I don't know it off the top of my head. And we're going to let this finish fermentation. What that means is when that airlock starts to show no activity at all, we'll come back and show you a reading. But one thing that's very important, a lot of people are starting to ask, I just put this together an hour ago and it hasn't started up yet. Should I be worried? No. Well, no, an hour is not nearly enough time. Yeast can take up to 72 hours, even sometimes four days to start up fermentation properly. Don't let that bother you. If, however, after two to three days, you're still seeing zero activity, check your seals, make sure everything's sealed up. Look for little tiny bubbles coming up the sides. If you see that, it's already started, don't worry. If none of that is happening yet, try raising the temperature in your home. No more, or, or even around it, like a heating mat or, you know, a heating Give pad. A you don't want to go past like that, you know, 75, 80 degree mark Fahrenheit, but get it up into the 70s and most times it'll start to kick off. Um, the other thing... Is if you don't have this much headspace, which means the layer of empty space between the top of your brew and your lid, then you may want to put this brand new fermentation on a cookie tray with a lip, with a lip so that way if to it contain gets the mess. excited and now ferments the, out of your airlock, you can The little it. Big Mouth bubblers are great for this because there is actually like a whole tray in here, which is meant for their internal airlock that doesn't really work. Don't use it. Use one of these. Um, but there's like a, a reservoir here, so it takes a lot for them to overflow. Like this would have to go all the way through and all the way up and all the way out and fill all this and then pour over. We've had it happen, so don't say it can't, but it, these are a little bit harder. Some of the other fermenters, it's really easy to get an overflow. 
If you find that it's way too aggressive in the first few hours or a couple of days, you can always put a blow off tube. We do have videos on those too, but essentially it's just stick a tube into your uh, bung here, just a piece of tubing like from your, your auto siphon, and put that into a mason jar or a larger container filled with water, sanitizer fluid, and let that go for like the first day or so. That way it has a clearer path to get out and it won't overflow and make a mess or possibly stop up your airlock and shoot it off into your ceiling as we've heard from some people having that happen. But for now, like she said, we're just gonna let this sit and we'll see in a couple weeks to let you know how it's doing. Okay, it's been like two weeks. Time to take a look at this and see how it's doing. Airlock activity was slow to a crawl, if anything at all. So, you know, time to take a look. We do give things a little bit of a swirl now and then, nothing too major. You don't have to, but we do it just to degas a little bit, move things around. Just Olfactory and optical inspection smells wonderful. It really does. Smells like my cheap red wine. Let's take a sample. See how it did. Now we used Lalvin 71B for this, which we used it for everything for a long time because it was very reliable for us. And we stopped using it only because people kept asking, how can we use 71B for everything? So I'm starting to see why we used it for everything. Because it, it works. works. <laughs> Look at that. Um, yeah, I'm gonna say 71B did the trick, 0.996. Now, is this done? Most likely. We're gonna let it sit for another week anyway, cause that's what you should do just to be on the safe side. But we did sanitize everything. So let me just take this out of here. So I am gonna pour the sample back in very gently. Can we? Yeah, we're just gonna tilt slightly and pour it like down the side so as to not cause even a bare ripple in the brew. Put the lid back on. Now you might be wondering, it's a 0.996, why are you letting it sit longer? Well, for one, we have a busy film day today. I really wasn't prepared to <laughs> rock this yet. And two, we always like to wait a week in between. Even if this, I doubt it, but even if this moved a couple more points, that could make a difference. So I'd rather just play it safe and leave it. It also proves you don't have to rack things right away, but just for the heck of it, let's find out where we're at. So we start at 1.096. We are now at 0.996. I don't even need a calculator for this one. It's 13.5%. Beautiful, that is pretty much exactly where we want this to be, but it's not done yet. So we'll see in a week. This is set for a couple of days. I didn't want to let it go too long because, you know, we want to get moving on this. It could just sit forever if we really wanted to, but it was a 0.996. I mean, how much further is it really going to go? It's probably done. But for the sake of thoroughness and consistency, and because we tell everybody else to, we're going to take our second reading and make sure that it's really completely done. It smells really good though. But I happen to like Concord grape wine. Um, I know it's not Derricka's favorite. I had no problem with it. I don't know oh, you don't like grape it. juice. Right. That's what it is. Once it's wine, it's fine. Oh, oh okay. I see how you are. <laughs> 0 0.996. Yeah, it's the same. Okay, so it is, gotta find a pen. Very particular about my pens. Some of them don't write well on certain surfaces. So this is 13.5%. Cool. It's also done. So what does that mean? It's time to rack. Yep, we're gonna move this off of the lees and the sediment that it's produced and put it into a whole other container. All right, so racking. What do we use for racking? We use an auto siphon. Why do we use an auto siphon, Brian? Why are you throwing it back at me for? <laughs> we use an auto siphon because A, it's easy, B, it's inexpensive, and C, it's very efficient. Meaning it keeps out of the brew what you don't want in the brew, and it keeps in the brew what you want in the brew, and it doesn't make a mess in the process. As you can tell by all the liquid that I'm spraying all over the kitchen, this has been sanitized. Yeah, everything that we use has been sanitized. Now we're leaving the cap on the end. This is not really just a dust cover. It, it actually serves a purpose. It keeps it from going too far into that sediment, so that way you don't suck up too much gunk. That's the technical term. Put the rack-er, no, rack-e, yeah. 
the, the destination. The destination. Lower, lower than, than the source. There. Make sure that your hose is in the destination. And you want it to be all the way towards the bottom. Yeah, you don't want to splash. But not completely smirched against the side, because right. then you're going to cause a mess. And then I go about halfway in and just get it going. And I'll hold it to the side um, rather than let it go all the way down, because if you hit the stuff in the bottom, it sometimes spurts up and makes a mess, and you suck up more goop than you really want. Basically, just pay attention to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Just be careful. It takes a little bit of practice, a little bit of experience, and a little bit of attention, which I sometimes am lacking in. And uh, you can get a nice clean product with minimal loss. There's always a little bit of loss when you rack, always, because you're getting rid of something from the brew. I mean, it's just the way it is. The more liquid you have in there means the sloppier you were at racking. That's really all it comes down to. Or the more fluffy and light and wispy the particles were, which that happens too. And this is something that comes up when you read information packets on yeast types. They will talk about their flocculation. And flocculation means their ability to fall out of suspension and create a nice yeast cake at the bottom. If they flocculate well, they're going to have a nice compact yeast cake on the bottom, thus forth not having that fluffy, stringy stuff that Brian was right. talking about. Like, people like to crap all over bread yeast. However, bread yeast makes a really great flavored brew, if done correctly. But what it doesn't do is flocculate well, because it's not made to do that. It's just not bread for that. So it tends to be wispy and messy. And you probably noticed, we don't use a lot of bread yeast on the channel anymore. Mostly because we found other yeasts that just work a little bit better and a little bit more consistent. Plus, bread yeast is a very generic term. We use that Fleischmann's, I don't remember if it's active dry or quick acting. There, there's like yeah, five different names. I think it's active dry. Okay, active dry. That was the one that we used and it worked pretty well, but it didn't flocculate all that well. So it made our brews less than pretty at the end of the day. Therefore, we started using other things. 71B, in our opinion, works really great, which is what we used in this. Uh, it flocculates well. As you can see, we have a really nice lease cake in the bottom here, not a lot of wispies. The brew is staying nice and clear, even as I, you know, talk and bounce it around a little bit while I'm racking. But it also keeps it from making a mess. That's the key. And as far as alcohol tolerance rate, it's um, it's up there. It's it's pretty darn close to... We're getting full. Yeah, we're getting full. Okay, well, we're just going to have to drink some of this then, I guess. Uh-oh. Um, wow. We really are getting full. Yeah. This happens sometimes. Okay, what I need now is something to put all this wine in so that we don't get rid of it. A pitcher? Um, Are we going to drink it right now? Probably. Going to have to. Oh, woe is us. This may take some time. This is how to not waste anything. See, this vessel was a little bit too small. We, did, we probably could have gone with a larger vessel, but we have plans. That's why I used a slightly larger vessel. And I'm, I'm just going to put this on here. Yes. Yeah. For safety. I'm just going to use the master baster. It's a little bit murky. I'm trying to just get the stuff right off the top. Didn't clear fully yet either. I think just the process of basting, the sucking. Yeah. The, well, they both suck. It's but. disturbing. <laughs> That's about as far as I dare go. But what we ended up getting out of that is about eight more ounces, okay? Eight ounces is uh, two glasses of wine. So. You know, that's one way to not waste as much. When you get close to the bottom, use a baster to suck up a little bit at a time. Don't be sloppy like I did. Made a bit of a mess. But hey, you know, where's the glass? In the cabinet. We're gonna do some sampling while we do the rest. There's my wine glass, first one I grabbed. So since we got a little babbly during our racking, I'd like to continue that babble if, if it suits you. and. The synopsis on yeast and what yeast to use, we are thoroughly aware that we're, we have an international audience and therefore certain items that we use on this show, like particular yeast strains, you may or may not have access right. to. So the best yeast to use is basically the yeast you can get. That said, I would like to make it clear that different yeasts do different things and can cause different flavors in your brew. A lot of brewers will tend to 
get down to two, three, or four different yeasts that they like to use and they're used to using, and they know what to expect from them, and that's as far as they go. And there's nothing wrong with that. We tend to be like that too. By the way, that's really good, even dry. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with experimenting too. Just know that every yeast is gonna create its own unique flavor components and esters, but they're all gonna be within a certain realm of normality, okay? Which means like from the most distant to the closest, they're not gonna make your brew taste completely different. They'll be slightly different flavors, slightly different esters. And that's something that comes with experience and time. Um, Sure, side by side, you're gonna be able to notice a difference, but in reality, you taste this today and taste a different one with a different yeast in a couple weeks, you might remember, oh yeah, that's a little bit different. But it's not like, a, oh, this one's horrible and this is amazing. You're not gonna get an 11 and a one with different yeast. Yeah, it's just it's not like gonna be that much on, a, on theme. a theme. Yes, exactly. This is actually quite nice. Maybe we don't have to sweeten it as much as I thought. I was, see, we're at that point now, this is gonna sit for a few days. We need to decide, are we gonna sweeten it or are we going to just let it go? I know I'm being very silent on my opinion of this, and that's because we just finished a tasting of a coffee mill, which is very strong in flavor. Yeah. And I think my palate is slightly askew right now. Drink more of this. <laughs> that's why I put it in a mug. It's... You can see how cloudy it is right now, though. That's because I did a sloppy job fracking. But I didn't want to waste it. It's got a really nice fruity flavor. Um, and I, I'm really liking the, like we added some wine tannin acid blend for tomato. It's got all those components. Like there's a good acid bite to it, but it's not overly done. The tannic aspect, I think it could use a little bit more tannin and we have plans for that. Right in my face. There. It was in her face. <laughs> it's not good to film when things are right in front of your face. Um, so, you know, all those aspects are working really, really well. I don't know. I'm I'm torn as to whether this needs sweetness or not. I think it needs to sit longer before I can make a a. Well, it's going to. Decision. We're just babbling because it's what we do. Yeah. All right. So what we're gonna do now? We're gonna put a note. Yeah. I just put a note that I racked it and put the label back on. It's gonna go back into fermentation station. It's gonna sit for like a week and see if it clears out a little bit more. Settle down some of the. Uh, sediment that I stirred up in the racking process, and we'll be back to show you what to do next. Okay, just to sum you guys up and catch you up to speed, this was started on March 22nd. Today is April 11th, so we're looking at like three weeks or so to this point, just to give you a rough idea. People are always saying, oh, how do you get your stuff to ferment so fast? Well, I think it's because we live in Florida and things are warm, so that could be a part of it. But what we're gonna do now, it's already been racked, okay? It's stable, we know nothing's gonna happen. Today, we're going to rack it to a pitcher and we're going to taste it for final sweetening and adjustments, okay? So, racking, you've seen us do it a million times. We got videos on it. We're just gonna do it. But there shouldn't be much in the bottom, so I am going to take the cap off. And before anybody asks, yes, everything was sanitized, including my hands, so everything is safe. We are racked. Now it is time to taste. And Initial taste is always just gonna be as it is, no changes, no alterations, just to see what it's like. I will say it smells very nice, especially for something this young. All right, here's my assessment. If you like dry red wine, Stop here, bottle it, done. That's all you gotta do. Yeah. It's it's very good right now. It has a delicious flavor, it has a lovely mouth profile, it's it has all the things that you want in a non-varietal wine. Yeah. Because remember this is just was this Concord. This is Concord. So this does not taste like a Concord grape wine anymore. No. It it definitely tastes a like a finer version of itself which is kind of cool, because all we really did was add some wine tannin and acid blend to it. The acidity level is beautiful. The tannic aspect fills your mouth. To me, if I was going to enjoy this, I want it sweeter. But like I said, if you like it dry, you can skip over the sweetening aspect and not worry about it. However, there is gonna be one other thing we're gonna do to this, and you wanna stick around and see that. Right, because I, I think that final step is gonna be equally 
applicable to whether you like dry or sweet. Yes. But I want it a little sweeter, so I'm going to add some sugar. This is just plain old white table sugar, and we're going to use the try it as you go method for sweetening. Now, I don't think this needs a tremendous amount of sweetening, so I'm just going to start with a little bit. Maybe a quarter pound, if that. I don't even think that was a quarter pound. Maybe probably like half a cup. I don't really measure on purpose. And I'm going to mix this up. Yes, it was sanitized. Notice I cut it. If you don't mix it up at this stage, you're not going to get a true idea of how sweet it is. And you might end up with something that's too sweet because it didn't get fully mixed in. Now, one caveat to doing this, we added real fermentable sugar to something that still has yeast in it that probably hasn't reached the tolerance. Nope, it hasn't. It was 71B. Has not reached the tolerance of said yeast. Therefore, what can happen? Well, it can re-ferment. So we definitely want to pasteurize this or stabilize it in some way. Our, our preferred method, obviously, is pasteurization, which we will get into in a little bit. When you're stirring like this to mix sugar in, you really don't want to disturb it much. You don't want to oxidize. You don't want to take many chances. Is there always a risk? Of course there is. There's a risk every time you take the lid off. There's a risk every time a breeze goes through your front door. But don't let that risk stop you from doing things, okay? So like in this case, we've opened this very infrequently. We've taken very little chances with it. It's probably still got a good amount of gas in it because we didn't degas. So I'm not as concerned about this kind of stirring that barely breaks the surface. But now I don't hear any more granules. So I think I'm done mixing. That is one of the benefits of back sweetening with sugar is that it's, it's a granule, so when you're stirring, you can feel and hear the crunchiness on the bottom. So you don't need a visual to tell you if it's done. You can use all your senses to tell you if it's been incorporated thoroughly. Many of you may be surprised by this, but it smells exactly the same. I think that's all I needed. That was, that is beautiful. Um, before we get to the next stage, I would like to take a reading so that we can tell them exactly what that final gravity is. Yep. So let's take a, a note that we racked it and we back sweetened it and I will get the, the hydrometer stuff out. Okie doke. So you might be wondering why we're going to take a reading now and why I didn't measure the sugar. It's because if I had said, I'm going to use X amount of sugar, but what if we had 128 ounces, 120 ounces, 110 ounces, it could change that perceived sweetness. And if we tell you that, and you have a few ounces different than us, it could change the perceived sweetness on your end too. So I'd rather give you a number that you can shoot for, which is gonna be the gravity reading, rather than an actual volume. Does that make sense? Because if the two volumes don't match, then it's not the same thing at all. So if I give you a, a specific gravity, you can actually aim for that and then everything matches and it all tastes the same supposedly, more or less. Okay, my guess for this, by the way, is that I think this is at like 1.006. I don't think it went any higher than that, but that's that's what I think. We're seeing how good my palate is for those sort of things. And I probably didn't even need to use the baster. Now, if you have watched our older videos, you will notice that our graduated cylinder is different. We switched from plastic to glass. Brewers Elite, who has been our hydrometer company of choice, we've been using them nearly since, since the very beginning. Yeah, since before they gave us this yeah. um, Offered us their newest kit that has the glass cylinder. And we really like the glass cylinder because it is actually significantly easier to read. Wow. I am shocked. It's 1.002. I was off by four points. That's That's unusual. This, for some reason, even when it was completely dry at 0.996, tasted much sweeter than it should. I think the fruity notes are really coming through in this, and that gives a perception of sweetness regardless of whether there's actual sugars right. in there creating and, the density. And that can come from, you know, when everything's in balance, you have your sweetness, your acids, your tannins, all in balance. It can it makes it taste better. Therefore, you don't need it to be as sweet. It's been said pretty often in homebrew that if you make something sweet enough, almost anything can taste good. And that is actually true. And that's where a lot of like beginner mead recipes are very sweet. So that you'll appreciate it because dry is a much more acquired taste. I'm not gonna pour that in there. 
Um, dry is more acquired taste for most of these things. I know some people that absolutely love dry, will never drink anything sweet, and I know other people that only drink sweet and will never drink anything dry. We tend to be a little bit of each. Yep. Depends. This to me is sweet, but it's not overly sweet. It has a sweet flavor, which is kind of interesting because it's only, you know, it. I, I wrote 1.004, it's 1.002. I was wrong even there. Um, so. I'm pretty happy about that. That also means there's less sugar in this, so less calories too. But anyway, let's get um, a fermenter so that we can put this into it for pasteurization. Already. All right, so it's back in a fermenter. Now, normally we use our closed mouth fermenters because I feel that the glass is a little bit stronger, but because we have something else we want to do with this, and I don't want to have to rack it again for no apparent reason, we are going to um, use this fermenter. We'll find out how it works. I am going to leave the lid on because I feel like the open mouth, that must allow more evaporation than others. So I just feel like <laughs> it. But I've also started leaving the airlocks and bungs in them and it bubbles a little, but it doesn't, doesn't seem to hurt anything, doesn't seem to affect anything, and they don't bubble too fast. Again, when you pasteurize, it's all about temperature control, okay? We have a video on it, but just very quick summary. This will go into a pot with water enough for our immersion circulator. Some people call them a sous vide, but it's actually an immersion circulator. And it'll be full up to probably about here. I heat that water to 145 degrees. That will get this to about 140 degrees internal temperature. Once this hits 140, let that go for 15 to 20 minutes, take it out of the water, set it on something wooden that isn't like metal or rock because you don't want to crack it. It is a little bit warm and let it come back to room temperature, put it back on the shelf. You're good to go. Once it's cooling, I do watch the airlock because sometimes they'll want to suck backwards because it's, it's, you know, uh, can creating a vacuum contracting. That's what it's doing. And it is creating a vacuum of sorts. So I do watch that and I'll just pull it out and put it back in and let it, let it reevaluate itself. But that's the idea. But we do still have one more step that we're going to show you after that. So stay tuned. But now we're going to go pasteurize this. Okay, so it's been a few more days. We pasteurized it. Can't tell if it cleared out at all, but... It's super dark. It's a very dark wine, so... But here's what we're going to do. We're going to do our final tasting today. But there's still another step. So this video is going to finish today, but there's another step that you're going to see in a couple weeks. In a separate video. In a separate video. Okay? Clear as mud, right? <laughs> Speaking of clear... Oh, it might be dark, but it's that clear. That is ruby clear, like it's gem-like. Yeah, that's what we were after. That's my favorite. It's your favorite? The super dark, oh. ultra vibrant. It's red. It's red. It's garnet. On clarity, yeah, it's like a nine. Like you can you can sort of see through it if you hold it up to the light. It is really dark. It's just very very dark. Yeah. Give it a little swirl. Give it a nose. Okay, it's Concord wine without a doubt. I get Concord, but there's so much more going on. Um, it smells a little more hmm, complex than just a straight Concord wine. Like if I put this next to my sweet red, it's similar, but it's not exactly the same. It almost smells like what we intend to do to it already. It kind of does, yeah. More on that in a minute. I'm going to take a taste. Mm. Now we sweeten this to 1.002. By most accounts, we will consider that to be dry still. According to some people with wine, though, this is just an off dry. But it has a rich mouth filling effect. The sweetness is there. The fruit flavors are coming through. Wow. The first thing I notice about it is the mouth feel. It has this beautiful velvety, it just kind of gets in there and gets all your taste buds excited and ready to go. It's rich in coating. Yeah. Um, the fruit flavor really comes through and I'm even getting like some of the other spices that I get sometimes from a grape. And that's like a cinnamon. There's a, almost a touch of a clove feeling, but it's not really like clove flavor. It's just like the feeling of clove. And that is probably the combination of the fruit and the ethanol playing off each other, making me think that that's what I'm tasting. Yeah. 
Um, but I definitely get like a, even a dark cherry note, dark fruit, not just the grape. It doesn't even just taste like grape. Kind of, yeah. yeah. Plums, um, even like almost a dried fruit flavoring, um, that smokiness coming through. Yep. I'm gonna sit this on top here. No, I'm getting more. You're getting more. Yeah. <laughs> I just hadn't san I didn't sanitize that section uh, of the table, so I wanted to sanitize the lid before putting it back on. Just yeah. This is just easy. This is taking my sweet red wine, which was just like you make it in the bottle that it came in, you know, from the store, and elevating it a bit with only a few simple changes. If you don't want to do those changes, you can totally still make this. It'll still be great. Yeah. This is not as sweet as the sweet red wine. No, it is not. By far not as sweet, but it has more flavor. It's much more complex. It's deeper. It's yeah. richer. Now, if you're one of those people that's very, how's a nice way to say this? Hoity about your wine. If you're very specific, you may not like this. If you're somebody that's a little more open-minded and willing to try new things, you may find that this is actually a nice experience for a wine. I would say this is a very nice table wine. Sure, sure. And if you had the ability to get your hands on a varietal grape juice rather than just Concord grape juice, yeah, you'd make a you really nice version. You could follow a very similar recipe and come up with something. Kind of like when we did the Merlot. Yes. Similar concept. Yes. And that's yes. the Merlot kind of produced this. Yes. We just wanted to see what if we did all the same stuff that we did to that with just a basic grape juice that's non-varietal. Well, it's varietal, but it's not a, a known variety for making wine. Right. And honestly, it comes out really nice. And the beautiful part about this is if you like your wine sweet, you can sweeten it. If you want it dry, we let it go dry. So you have that option still. And that I just like that. Customization, you know, be like Burger King, brew it your way. It's funny, recently we've been really enjoying wine on ice. And I know mm. for some of you, that's yeah, probably so just the worst thing I could say. We're just ever. lazy. But <laughs> I think it's because typically when we drink wine, we pair it with food, and the food is really hot, and having the contrast of something chilled is is pleasant. And particularly our sangria that just so potent flavor wise that the, the chilling effect really doesn't hinder this would be very good or this take too. down the flavor. But this is room temperature that we're tasting it. And I am enjoying it. Yeah, I think this is great. Just as as much as I am the the, the uh, chilled versions. So that's nice. when I really think about it, I get cherry, plum, moderate Concord grape flavor. Um, the ethanol is coming through a little bit. This is thirteen and a half percent. I do taste the ethanol flavor, and I think that's a nice balancing act in this one. Yeah. There's a really lovely tannic component that makes your mouth kind of pucker just just a little tiny bit you know it's there yep. but it makes you feel like it's very thick um because obviously it's it's not actually thick but it feels viscous in the mouth i i think we succeeded i mean i i can't imagine how oh wait i can't imagine one thing that we might be able to do to this but as it is right now we need to put a score on it we do okay i i have a number do you have a number i do as well one Two, three, Nine. ten. It's a ten. I know what we're gonna do to it next, but to me, it's still a ten. This is this is beautiful. This is wonderful. Yeah, I, and I cheated. I gave it a nine because I do know what we're gonna do it next. Yeah. Do next. So she wants to leave room for the ten. I, I want to leave that with a word. I, I'm leaving room for an eleven. All right. I, that's how I'm seeing that's, it. That's that's fair. I'm okay with that. Well, our sweet red wine was one of my top five favorites last time we did this. This I think knocks the sweet red wine out. This took its place. It's just it's, that little bit better. It's just a little, eh, eh, just a little you know? Now, those of you that haven't figured it out yet, that thing that we're going to do, we're going to add some wood to it. And we didn't do this initially because I wanted to see what this was like without, to see, does it really need it? Because we did add wine tannin, which is essentially ground up this, ground up wood. Now, what this is, is French, and it's really hot, I'm sorry. That is a French oak sherry infused French oak. Um, Derek will say where it's from. Barrel, aid, barrel char wood products. There you go. And we have, we'll have a link to it below. We don't actually get paid by them. No. It's they're they're kind of a sort of sponsor. They send us some stuff once in a while. Um, but I soaked it in some hot water to sanitize it and to get some of the tannins out so that it won't over tannin. 
and we're just we just dropped it in like you saw. So lots of people that ask, well, how long should you leave that in there? And that is a good question. Unfortunately, we don't have a good answer for that because it varies greatly depending on a multitude of factors. One of them being your taste. <laughs> right. That's certainly one of them. One of them being how much alcohol is in your beverage. One of them being the temperature range. Not only what temperature it's at, but does that temperature fluctuate? All those things are going to change how quickly or how slowly the essence of the wood is instructed into your room. Yes, she's absolutely right. If it's warmer, it's going to extract faster. If it's cooler, it's going to extract slower. Um, higher alcohol is going to extract a little bit more and a little different. It's going to extract different flavor compounds yeah. than if it was lower alcohol. So all those things come into play. We have found French oak to be far and above our favorite for an average oaking, okay? There is one, the Emberana, but that's very specific. I didn't yeah. think those flavors worked as well with this. No. It's kind of like a French toast flavors. Yeah. Um, it could be nice, but I didn't want to mess it up. Yeah. Um, there was talk, Erica wanted to pull one bottle without the wood, and I said, but here's the thing, we're only going to leave the wood on it for a couple of weeks, probably. And we do uh, want to have fine. an excess of headspace that the removal of one bottle Yeah, that was created, my so. biggest worry. So we didn't do that, but stay. Don't fall off. Okay. <laughs> Need to dry the lid. And you put the. Date. I put it. I took the notes and did the thing. Okay. All right. So that is it for our upscale cheap wine. But we will have an additional video coming up soon. It'll be a couple of weeks. Once this has time to sit, we'll do another tasting and see if this really does get to 11. But in the meantime, as always, guys, thank you so much for watching and have a great day. Bye bye.